So hey guys, welcome to this video today. I'm joined by Dr. John Rawlinson, my anatomy supervisor for first and second year. So um, would you like to uh, introduce yourself, Dr. Rawlinson, to my viewers? Sen, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for asking me. As you know, anatomy has fascinated me and I have a great enthusiasm for anatomy. And so to be able to share my enthusiasm with you is a great joy indeed. Thank you. I'm completely, uh, I'm blessed to have Dr. Brawlinson here. He's been a great inspiration over the last two years uh, and has made anatomy a lot more interesting than I initially thought it'd be. Uh, initially, before I came, I thought it'd be quite just rote learning, but you made it completely different. And hopefully I can share the um, enthusiasm that Dr. Rawlinson has for anatomy uh, and, the develop um, ho and hopefully today I can share the enthusiasm that Dr. Rawlinson has for anatomy and also the love that I've picked up over the last two years with you guys. So before we begin, I'd like to um, shout out Medify.co.uk for uh, making this video possible. And um, let's begin. Sen, thank you very much. Now, since the beginning of my student days, 50 years ago, and I hear you cry, Dr. Rawley, can you really be that old? <laughs> I've been fascinated by anatomy. I've loved, I loved the dissections at Guy's Medical School, and I intercalated an anatomy degree in, into my medical course. Uh, I, shortly after qualifying in, in medicine, I spent a very happy year as anatomy demonstrator in the University of Aberdeen. Um, you know, helping perplexed students in the dissecting room was a constant delight. I well remember an Aberdeenian girl with a frown on her forehead saying, oh, Dr. Rawlinson, there's an awful girl of things in here. Now, where would I find the musculocutaneous nerve? <laughs> Aha! That brings good memories. <laughs> Aha, quoth I, spreading my blunt scissors. Is this what you're looking for? Well, there you see, it's, it's discovery. It's mm. sweet discovery. It's the exploration and the discovery of the, the wonderful fabric of the human body. Now, you, you remember my talking about Andreas Vesalius, yes, don't definitely. you? The, the father of anatomy who produces De Humani Corporis Fabrica in the 16th century, which is a, a magnificent account of anatomy as revealed by dissection. What you chaps do week by week, and you are very lucky in Cambridge to have an anatomy course that allows you an almost full dissection. Mm. So you see, my enthusiasm has been boiling away for, for some time and it will never cease as long as there are venae comitantes and anastomoses <laughs> to tease out with probe and forceps and with words. Yes. Now, before I get into the anatomical words, it may be helpful to put this into context. After anatomy in Aberdeen, I followed my heart into Scottish rural general practice. You see, I'd always been an aficionado of Dr Finlay's casebook. Dr. Cameron was my role model. Well, well. And then after that, into practice in uh, Cambridgeshire, rural West Cambridgeshire, for 31 years. Oh. Uh, having a special interest in, in training GPs and in ophthalmology. Well, you can imagine, as my delight in anatomy always beckoned, how pleased I was at Dr. Ajoka's kind invitation to supervise anatomy here in this lovely and exciting place, Jesus College, for, for so it is. And I'm in the tenth year of this privilege, which means that my first three or four years worth of students are now in clinical practice. Gosh. And I sometimes wonder what it is they remember of the content of their anatomy supervisions. In fact, actually, a few years ago at a Jesus Medsoc dinner, I put this question to a senior student and he said, well, I remember your poem on such and such and such and such region of the body. The poems are absolutely wonderful. From the way they describe anatomy, the way they link all the concepts we learn in the dissection room together. Um, it's wonderful. Would you possibly be yes. able to share a few later? I would be happy to. So it brings me back to the expression of anatomy through words. Words, the use of words in distilling feelings and thoughts into words has always fascinated me. Poems about all sorts of things, including 
anatomy. Sometimes helps me to remember what I need to or want to remember. Now take, for example, the facial nerve. Oh, yes. <laughs> the seventh cranial nerve and its amazing course through geniculate ganglion, petrous temporal bone fastnesses, the strange joinings with the corda tympani, remember that? Uh, and then enclosed within the parotid gland until it finally emerges onto the playing fields of facial movements of expression. Yes. So here goes. Cranial nerve seven, from rock to sun, the magnificent journey of the magnificent seventh. Here I go, squeezed tight within the petrous cliff, knee under my chin, in truth, you know, I'm glad to shed that weeping, sniffing, slobbering greater petrosal and that fussy little stapedial with its hush that din pianissimo patter. Here my lips smack a welcome to Corda Timpani with his crazy coarse sat nav. Though I must say he's a fellow of good taste with a penchant for pepper, merlot, mint, cocoa, mmm, and marmite on the tip of your tongue. A few millimetres more, and sweet release, freedom, cheerio, stylomastoid gloom, say I, but, but, in a slippery salivary trice, I'm gone again, shrouded in a cumulus cloud of soggy parotid. Can't see a thing, Mr. Surgeon. I hope you can see me. Parotid traversed, here comes my starburst, out into a world of winking, whistling, snivelling, sneering, pouting, pursing, and at last, at last, at long geniculate at last, the magnificent journey's over and done. And I smile, yes, I smile, in the warmth of the sun. Remember that? <laughs> like I said, these poems are absolutely wonderful. Um, so if you guys want, you can try and actually listen to the poem again by skipping back and try and follow the poem and sort of follow the path of the facial nerve and see how it all just fits together and the poem just makes sense yeah. <laughs> and if you guys want you can use them for revision tools um so i think uh, something similar uh, on similar lines may i give you a little snippet of another cranial nerve yes please definitely yeah. please definitely do so uh, this is a a little ode to the abducent nerve cranial nerve six which devotes itself entirely to supplying the lateral rectus muscle. Now, this is the muscle which, because it allows the lover to gaze upon his or her beloved without too obvious movements of the head, this muscle has been called the musculus amatorius, the lateral rectus. Now, here we go again, bound this time for the cavernous sinus and beyond. Oh, and by the way, the Italianate reference to Signor Dorello is to do with Dorello's rather rarefied description of a tiny bony canal transmitting the sixth nerve en route to the cavernous sinus. Now that's starred first stuff for you then. Mm -hmm. The long and lonely road of the nervous abducens, a thread of hopefulness Rising from brain stem groove, it strings through a system and squeezes into the hard, hard membrane of Signor Dorello's canale. At the Matterhorn tip of the rocky temporal, it flexes, hugging the pulse of brain bound carotid, wrinkling the skin of a blood filled cavern, and sneaks into a crowded fissure, beyond which, at last, at long and weary last, the welcoming, lean, flat flank of musculus amatorius slides seductively into view. Ah, the end of a perilous journey. Phew. Uh, I'm speechless. As in, I'm, I'm sure you guys can hopefully relate to this, as in hopefully relate to how the, this poem links the anatomy, the actual structure of this, you know, for example, muscle, of this nerve, of these nerves, to their function. And structure and function are very important in, that, in anatomy, aren't they? Utterly. Uh, you may remember the very first supervision of the first year about the clavicle. It mm -hmm. always begins with a key bone of the clavicle. 
I pointed out that no bone bears any knob or excrescence or wrinkle or hole without telling a story of what those parts of the bone do. Structure and function are, of course, interrelated totally. Either current function or embryological function in, in months past. During development? During development, yes. With regards to anatomy, of course a lot of students do ask, should I know anatomy whilst applying for interviews? Do you think that if students are interested for anatomy, they should look into a bit before they apply? Or do you think they should leave it until afterwards once they're, um, for once they're here at Cambridge? I think students applying for medical school have got so many things to think and worry about in respect of their personal statements and their A-level studies and their uh, job attachments, work experiences. There's so much in the portfolio of getting ready for your interview at medical school that I wouldn't burden your brain with anatomical names. That's a joy and a delight yet to come in future. But I would suggest that perhaps you thought about something anatomical, like the heart. Just have a think about what the heart is, is all about. Or uh, look at a bone and just think what it is that that bone tells you about the function of that bone, the function of that part of the body. It's possible, it's possible that an, an interviewer in your medical school interview may pass you a bone or a plastic model of a bone and say something very Cambridge-like, Sen, talk to me about this. You see? And of course it seems like a very abstract concept, just being given a bone and trying to speak about it. What's important is that if you learn to think about simply the shape of the bone, why it has different roughenings or smooth surfaces, the size of the bone, you can kind of, I think, say a few thoughtful comments about it. And of course they don't expect you to know everything about the bone, do they? They just, I think, expect you to sort of be able to suggest a few things and hopefully um, just come up with something thoughtful. Here's a scowl. You can do the Shakespearean bit about uh, Yorick, I knew him well, Horatio, or you can think in that skull, what's actually going on? What's this cranium about? What's happening there? What's this facial skeleton hanging down from the, from the brain case doing? And just, just think about function in terms of the structure in your hands. If this does happen, don't get scared. That's, that's one thing. Use this as an opportunity to really explore why this bone is shaped in this way, or why this organ or whatever part of the body is shaped in this way and how it relates to its function and allows it to fulfil its purpose. Anatomy is an exploration, it's a discovery, it's, it's very, very fascinating. So I was wondering if you had any more poems to share. Well now, Sen, you'll um, remember the, the Christmas vacation essays in the first oh, year, yes. the anatomy of pulling a Christmas cracker or of eating a Christmas pudding. Mm -hmm. Now, titles which were certain to amuse the, the gathered family. When the student member sits at the festive board analysing his forearm musculature, or his thinner muscles as he thoughtfully spoons on the brandy butter. Yes. Well, now, akin to this is one of my uh, most recent poetic oeuvre, in this head and neck term just finished, in fact, which concerns the matters of chewing and swallowing. The title, Après la Pâtisserie, is inspired by the Pâtisserie Valérie at the bottom end of Jesus Lane here. Ah, le gâteau, mais c'est merveilleux. Such gastronomic suavity, from puckered lips and wagging tongue, entrez mon vieux into the oral cavity where teeth will cut and hold and slice and grind to fibre in a trice, the tongue, speech done, becomes a tool to make a sculpturing of Christmas cake. Prehensile grip, a mucus slip from tip of tongue to epiglottic ceiling bung, the bun, upon its downward course, is chewed and skewed from bolus crude and pharyngeal forces to deliver it, to slither it, into a plunging shoot, a sliding newt, sustenance, glottic dance, palatal prance, tonsillar glance, and down, down, down to gastric churning, acid burning, the first suggestion of sweet digestion. Ah, mais c'est délicieux, n'est-ce pas? <laughs> oui, c'est très délicieux. <laughs> Another wonderful pair. Um, that patisserie Valerie is very nice. Very, very nice, nice indeed. So next time, if you guys visit Cambridge, 
suggest listening to his poem in that passage of Valerie. Was this poem wrote there by any chance? Or was it inspired by that? Inspired by passing and gazing into the window. Ah. <laughs> on, my, on my way to, on my route to, what I called, what is, a very special place, Jesus College. And this, this next little poem, uh, which comes from the lower limb term, mm-hmm. is specially for Jesus College medics. May I read this to you? Please do. Well. It's, uh, it refers to the chimney. Now, the chimney is that glorious approach to the College Lodge and also to Barry Flanagan's amazingly dynamic dancing hair sculpture beside the cricket field. Mm -hmm. And uh, and this poem, along with uh, a YouTube viewing of um, Jeremy Fisher's dance from the Tales of Beatrix Potter, remember that? A wonderful, wonderful... Which we always watch with eyes agog. It's an illustration of the wonderful apparatus, which are our lower appendages, which we must never, ever take for granted. Listen, and imagine, if you will, a life without legs. When we would be rocking and bobbing to and fro, like those kiddies' toys you can't knock over, longing to leap on a bicycle, but without the undercarriage to push pedal and chain from chimney to downing and back again. How we would yearn for the snugness of bald and socketed hips, bigelow bowed with inverted Y, flicking their wisps of foveal strands, and the load levering strength of mortised ankle securely fitting pots permitting, ligament tight at the very basement of the muscular movement. And peons of praise we'd genicularly raise for the muscle-tight hinges, the bursa-bade fringes and the slide, rock and twist of the impossible, wonderful knee. Oh, how we would bless its synovial acres, its deformable discs of gristle that would cushion our leaps and dances down the chimney of living. If only, if only we had them, if only we could dangle swinging legs from the benediction of cruciates and tickle the skin of the world with our calcaneal scufflings, if only. How we would envy the lithe limbs of the dancing hare racing past the cricket square, which would be for legless us terra incognita of unreachable delight. So there you have it. Never take your legs for granted. Hmm? That's very true. It's only when you injure your legs do you realise how useful they are and how debilitating it is without them. And this poem brings back such good memories from second term last year when we were learning about the lower limb. Initially it was very confusing. There were lots of things going on, but um, with Dr. Rawlinson's guidance, it just made it seem like a breeze. Well... Would you allow me, Sen, to finish with one last poem? I have no hesitations at all. Please, yes. It's an extract from a poem that I I always keep to the end of the head and neck term for two reasons. First, because its subject matter, the pterygopalatine fossa, Mm. is a tricky region to define at first. And amongst all its complexities, it's tucked away in a very tightly packed region of our bodies just here. And, and secondly, because, well, because it's one that I enjoy reciting very much to the amused bewilderment of my poor students. It's called De Profundis, which has nothing whatever to do with Oscar Wilde, by the way, but is a, a reference to the opening verses of Psalm 130. De Profundis clamavi ad te domine. From the depths I have called unto thee, O Lord. Now, you will recall, I'm sure you'll recall, that the pterygopalatine ganglion is a relay station for the secretor motor nerve supply to the lacrimal glands and to the mucoceres glands of the nose and the palate and the pharynx. And because of this, its nickname is the ganglion of hay fever. Mm-hmm. So here goes. De profundis, pterygopalatine delvings. De profundis, Clamavi ad te domine. From the depths, from the deep recesses of the temple, I have called to you. 
And I declare the weeping of the eyes, the dripping of the nose, the aching of the teeth, the whole pterygopalatine panoply of maxillary happenings. What can you hear? When salt tears trickle and the pharyngeal tickle slips off the palate's lifting slide, when a eustachian washing, a mucinous sloshing round the pillars of forces swiftly glide, can you hear it? Can you hear the humming and the thrumming, the sparking and the buzzing, the fizzing and the sizzling and the darkness of the fossa? And can you feel the soft summer wind brush your cheek, the farewell kiss, the autumnal bliss of a falling leaf? Well, that's thanks to you, pars secunda nervi trigeminalis, spanning the ceiling of your bony fastness. And when you sense the soft stir of a late vernal breeze. Do you weep, wipe the tears? Do you sniff, dab the nose? In the springtime, the only pretty ring time, hey, nonny, nonny, no, sweet lovers, count the pollen. And when in soggy tissue and scarlet flood, the water and blood stream from the stricken side of the noisome nose, seashelled, bunged up, do you curse the excesses of the sphenopalatine, nasopalatine torrent? Do you? Well then, in all that warmth and humidity, mist and liquidity, maytime cupidity, you may follow the trail of the sneeze, the push and the squeeze of nerves as they slink through foramen and chink, raising peons of praise for neural relays of maxillary busyness. Here, deep and snug within, so very deep and snug within, the tiny, tiny chink in the depths of the temple where Solomon, in all his glory, can't hold a guttering candle to the terry-go-round, to the merry-go-round, to the round as old as time, thoroughly, deeply palatine marvels. De profundis. There. Sen, that's enough. <laughs> And as, it, as they used to say on the wireless, if you have been, thank you for listening. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Rawlinson, for um, sharing your lovely poems and sharing your uh, wonderful insight into um, anatomy. Now, before we finish today, the people watching are mostly people um, in sixth form who are really inspired to study medicine and who really want to um, have the best of chances to getting in and being successful. Now, please, before we end, would you be kind enough to share three tips that you think medical students should consider, or, sorry, aspiring medical students should be considering and should take into account to help them um, you know, as best as possible when they're applying? Follow your heart and follow your head. Follow your heart, be enthusiastic. If you really, really want to be a doctor, don't let anybody put you off. It is the most wonderful profession and long, long, long though the course is, it gets met better and more fascinating and more engaging year after year. Don't be put up. If you, or if you want to be a doctor, stick with it. Secondly, of course, you've got to follow your head. You've got to go into medical school application with your eyes wide open. Wonderful profession though it is, it has its downsides as well as its upsides, of course. At times it is very tiring and the burden of clinical responsibility is something which no one can ever take lightly. You've got to think about it, you've got to look after yourself both as a medical student and, and as a doctor. There now, does that help? That's extremely useful and hopefully you appreciate these tips that Dr. Wallison has given you. And um, once again, thank you so much for your time Dr. Wallison uh, for, taking, you know, for taking your morning filming this. Um, thank you so much to Medify.co.uk for making this video possible. And last but not least, make sure you guys keep working hard. Um, applying and going through everything you guys are going through is tough. It's a long journey. There are many hoops to jump through. But if you look at this, you'll have amazing, amazing people like Dr. Rawlinson supervising you, looking after you, teaching you once you get into medical school. So the hard work truly does pay off. It's been a joy. Thank you, Zen. Thank you so much, Dr. Take care, guys. Bye-bye.